have a, a little chance afterwards to uh, um, for people to share Keith's story. So if you, if you can think of one you want to, you'd like to, to share with the audience. Um, I, uh, I'm always uh, interested to, to, to hear about it. Um, so, well, I'll move on here to Mushroom Valley. Next slide. This is, the, Mushroom Valley is a name of like, sort of like a lost neighborhood, or it was, it was a neighborhood for like a hundred years. Um, and it was approximately what is now uh, Plato Boulevard, uh, and then running under Water Street, running under the High Bridge. Uh, so it was a, in, on one side of the Mississippi River Valley. And it was named that because it, for about a century, uh, from the 1880s to 1980s, there, uh, there were all these mushroom operations in the sandstone caves uh, along those along that stretch uh, of the valley. And in this image here, you see the largest uh, of those old mushroom caves. It's called the, it's called the Becker Sand and Mushroom Company Cave, uh, and it was quite extensive. And I just think that name is significant. I, well, what a name for company. Sand and mushrooms. <laughs> it's like one thing, one of you might eat the mushrooms, what do you do with the sand? Okay, you may use it as foundry sand for molds and deal you know, with, with cast iron or maybe for perhaps use the silica for making glass. Uh, but so this, this went on in the same cave at the same time. Part of the cave was mining sand and creating the cave itself. And then as they moved on, then the mushroom growing operation moved into that space. And so it was just like this constant mushroom frontier who advancing into the depths of the cave as a, more and more was mined out. Now this image is from 1923. And it's sort of like a, a, a a prehistoric version of Photoshop. They kind of touched up that um, that cart there, but people would go in these caves and just they just describe them as like as, as big as medieval cathedrals. And, and and you know now it's hard to understand why. When you look at a picture like this, you, you can kind of see that. Why you know, and you look way off in the distance and you see see some dim lights up in the altar way and the you know way the heck down. Uh, at the other end, and so it does kind of resemble a temple or a, a cathedral of sorts. Next slide. And this is what an old mushroom growing operation looked like. Um, they, they would just grow the, uh, the mushrooms on the floor of the cave, and then there was a narrow path where you could kind of walk, uh, and they have just a minimum space for walking along that path. Um, but it is, this is a very old mushroom operation, in fact, because uh, the, these floor type operations, they actually grew the mushrooms on the floor of the cave, um, were very soon superseded by the sort of things that we're more familiar with now, where you have like what look like bookshelves and all these wooden trays and so on stacked up one over top of the other. That, that tray system, as it's known, utilizes the cave space much better because you got, you know, you're not just using the, you know, the square area of the floor. You have like that at every single level in those stacked trays. So it's a much, you get a much greater volume of mushrooms growing if you're using trays and if you're just growing them uh, on the floor. But one of the reasons that this is now an extinct St. Paul industry. Is one of the reasons they were able to survive so handily is they got a lot of their stuff for free for growing these mushrooms, and that is what it took a lot. It took an awful lot of horse manure <laughs> in here, and, and uh, that was free for the taking back in the day. You didn't have to buy that stuff; they just let you sweep it off the streets and have it for nothing. So you know, it, but you know, as horses were as horses went away. Um, you know, they had to go further afield for, to get the, the, the horse manure. And horse manure has some really special properties. Uh, you know, it can't replace it like with pig manure or something else like that, or human manure. It just, it just there, there are certain things um, about it uh, that, that are very special. And, and even down to, 
not only that, but the horses have to be raised under special conditions, I mean, in special orders. For example, one guy thought he would get a whole bunch of horse manure. And uh, so the horses would do their thing, and they would you know, sweep it up right away, and then start spreading it in the cave, and nothing would grow on this. It's like, it's just mystified. Why is anything growing here? And there's another guy who would collect it from the filthy stalls. And he had no problem. Well, guess what? When the horse lays down that manure and then urinates all over that stuff, that's the good stuff. Oh. If, if he's too clean, if he's too clean, you want to get it out of there, right, you know, clean it up right away and stuff. So, next slide. So here is a map of the Becker Sand and Mushroom Company cave. Uh, and this map was created in the early 1960s. Most of the maps of the caves, the lagering caves and the mushroom caves that we have today were created in the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, because the, they, the, the, uh, the a firm was TKDA, it was the, the architectural firm still around. They were hired to map out all these underground spaces, you know, the spaces under City Hall, the mushroom caves, the library caves, for use as fallout shelters. Okay? And, you know, we, we, I'm sure everyone here remembers the fallout shelter craze of the early 60s, um, you know, civil defense and all that. Uh, so here, what they would do is they would map the cave out and then and then try to come up with how many people would fit inside that cave in, in the case of a, a nuclear catastrophe. Next slide. But one thing they didn't realize is that not everyone likes to go in caves. Yeah. <laughs> Even if to save their life they will not go in a cave if they're claustrophobic, they'd rather stand out there and get a full dose of fallout. Um, and, and fallout incident, that's, you know, when, when the nuclear explosion occurs, it kicks up a lot of dust, so to speak. And that, all that stuff is radioactive and it comes down to Earth. It's a short-lived radioactivity. But if it lands on you, that's, you know, you're going to get irradiated. If you can get into a shelter for a certain period of time, and that radioactivity dies off and, and, uh, and you, know, you're, uh, you know, you're safe from that. Um, but so, so people go, there are some claustrophobic people. How do you get them into a cave? Well, they invented a cure for claustrophobia. There's a pill that you can take, they found, that <laughs> cures claustrophobia. And it's like, ta-da. So if you're claustrophobic, you might want to maybe, I don't know if it's over the counter or anything. It's called phenobarbital. <laughs> so you take this magical pill, and guess what? You don't care anymore. You're in there. You're fine. <laughs> Here's some other civil defense memorabilia. Uh, one of those old uh, water supply things. Uh, you know, a water supply container, 17 and a half gallons, and then when you're done drinking the water, then you can, uh, you know, flip it over or whatever, use it as a commode. So it's a very useful thing. I actually did. There was a lot of this debris in the caves at one time around here. I never got any of it, but uh, this this one was actually this photograph was actually taken in Longhorn Caverns, where they down near the LBJ Ranch in Texas. And I was amused taking the tour down there. You to go and find out that the LBJ himself, in the event of a nuclear apocalypse, would go down, scurry down into this filthy cavern and hide down there. Next slide. So here, here's some more, here's some more caves in Mushroom Valley. These are the so-called V caves. Now it was V for victory because it was World War II, but it was also the V was more importantly for what? Vion, the, the Vion caves, because they had Vion box of lumber uh, along Channel Street, what has now become Plato Boulevard, of course. And and it's been replatted. Um, but they had 14 sandstone caves, which they rented out for all different kinds of purposes. Uh, and one of the purposes that they would rent out these caves is they rented one of them to the university. Next slide. 
And that was the U cave. So the, there were the V caves, and one of them was the U cave, the university cave, the University of Minnesota. Because some guy in the year, the dairy scientist at the University of Minnesota in the 1930s, he came from an area where, uh, of Missouri, where they had ripened blue cheese um, underground in caves. And he came here and he said, look at all this space. Now let's, let's, you know, you got mushrooms. You had mushrooms for a long time. Uh, why don't we start ripening blue cheese? Um, and so they did, and uh, it, it just blue cheese requires a 60-day ripening period. Uh, and you put it in the cave, and uh, it, uh, it, it works very nicely. Uh, this was in the 1930s, and unfortunately, the, uh, believe it or not, the, the, an official from the French government or from the embassy or whatever came, came over to St. Paul and said, you can't do this. You can't do this because you know, you're calling... You, but basically what you're doing, you're, you're calling it Roquefort, and it's not true Roquefort from France, so you've got to stop this now. And that's when, the, that's when the, the name blue cheese was invented. So, okay, it's not, okay, we'll call it Roquefort, call it blue cheese instead. Hmm. The real heyday of the cheese caves in St. Paul was after the fall of France in World War II. Because, you know, forget munitions and things like that, we got cut off from our supply of French Roquefort at that point. <laughs> so St. Paul truly, and I wrote a whole article about this, St. Paul truly became like the, the blue cheese capital of a large area um, at that point. The French were in no condition to like boo it or you know, say anything about it uh, at that point. Craft cheese came in here, rented caves in here to uh, to, to make their brand of, of blue cheese. Next slide. Another dairy-related industry um, in Mushroom Valley uh, was the St. Paul Milk Company. They used, uh, they didn't make the milk underground, I guess, or keep the cows underground or anything so prosaic and mundane as that, but they did, uh, you, for some reason, they uh, used some of the caves along Water Street, so like an underground parking garage. And then when they left, they just forgot to take those trucks with them. And so they are if they are still there today, buried in uh, these eternal white snow drifts of St. Peter's sandstones. The sand grains fall one by one over the years, and kind of buried, it's like a truck lodged in a snow drift. So, and, um, so I, I, maybe someday they'll, they'll you know, dig them out of there. Next slide. I think perhaps the, the most interesting thing to, to occur in Mushroom Valley or was when the, uh, the, the, they started making nightclubs in these, building nightclubs in these former mushroom caves. And sometimes, well, sometimes I said the mushrooms uh, growing discontinued right alongside the nightclub stuff. And Oliver Town, the, the renowned pseudonym of uh, yeah, Gareth Hebert, the columnist. Um, and he wrote that this is the uh, perhaps the strangest nightclub belt in the world, meaning along through Mushroom Valley, because it had Mystic Caverns at one end and then Castle Royal at the other end of Mushroom Valley. And if there was any cave, however, I could go back to in history that you know, uh, that, you know, just to, just to look at, just to experience it, uh, it would be this one, uh, Mystic Caverns. Um, Mystic Caverns still exists as a cave. Um, I'm sure you know, probably know where that parking lot is for the, uh, the brickyards in Lilydale. There's that little small, there's that small parking lot where Water Street uh, ends and Joy Street begins in the woods. And that's right off of the woods there, that location is where Mystic Caverns was located. And I, I explored it extensively in the 90s. There's nothing left of the old, opera, the old nightclub operation from the 30s. But you just get a sense of how wonderful this place was by reading this newspaper advertisement. You know, see the beautiful silver cave and the rainbow shower of 2,000 years dying, drink, and dance, the, the Jack Foster's 10 cave. I mean, it was much more elaborate than this. 
They had the, the valets were dressed in skeleton costumes. <laughs> and they would, you know, a skeleton would come up to your car and offer to park it. Um, they had you know, all kinds, you know, they had a, a big brass rail kind of bar in there. Uh, you know, a hardwood floors. The um, magicians would, you know, they had the proverbial smoke and mirror type acts there. Um, Sally ran the new fan dancer and was there. I mean, this place is, was really a hopping place in its day. And uh, the city, of course, doesn't like people having fun, so they found some technicality to shut it down shortly thereafter. But this, it was, it, I really would have loved to have seen this. Like, you can see it. I think it, it gives pretty good directions here for how to get there. Um, go over the Wabasha Street Bridge and look for the huge neon skull and crossbones. I would love to have seen that like up on the cliff or wherever it was. Next slide. And at the other end, of course, we have Castle Royal. Now, Mystic Caverns opened in April of 1933, right as Prohibition was ending. Okay, and then Castle Royal at the other end of the valley uh, in October of 1933. Um, and of course, it's uh, successfully, it's been reincarnated uh, several times. And of course, uh, is you know, now in the successful direction of uh, Donna and, and Steve Bremer. And I, it's just, it, it just is a joy in my heart that they, they that this cave is, is so well maintained. We have this this, this wonderful uh, um, relic from the past, and and I I like the tours there because every time I take a tour, it's like spaced out at several years intervals, and it's it's always something different there. Next slide. A few slides of sand mines. Next slide. Ford sand mines. These were the now we had these these little sand mines. These little hundred footers, if you will, along the Plato Boulevard and Water Street. Um, but that doesn't, the, but the, the largest uh, mine that was, you know, carved out for silica, for, for glass making, uh, was the one under the, the Ford Motor Company plant um, in, in the Highland Park neighborhood of St. Paul. And I grew up in that neighborhood, and my brothers come back with breathless tales of going in there and, uh, and you know, having all, all kinds of weird things happen to them. Uh, and uh, this, this mine is two and a half miles long, and it was uh, in operation from the 1930s to the 1950s. And again, this is, what they do is they take, they take this St. Peter sandstone, which is has very few impurities. Glass, incidentally, is very sensitive to impurities. I mean, just a, you know, just a, a small percentage of iron can greatly discolor the glass. You really want to start out with the pure sand if you can to reduce the, the production cost. Uh, and so the St. Peter sandstone was ideal. So there they are. There's a Ford Motor Company right under their very plant. They had this immense supply of silica that they could use for making windshield glass. And I'm not sure, I, I've asked Ford, I've met one Ford company historian after another, I said, why did they stop making glass here? They can't answer me. But I think it's because they, they found an even purer deposit, in, deposit of sandstone in Michigan, the Sylvania sandstone, which is even remarkably purer than the St. Peter sandstone. Next slide. Uh, another large space carved out by the Ford Motor Company was the uh, the Marina Cave. Well, every generation had its name for this. Some called it the Marina Cave. Some called it the uh, the Univac Caves. Um, and uh, for a long time, from 1982 to 2004, it held the uh, the Tunnel of Terror. I assume people here remember the Tunnel of Terror. Uh, that, uh, that the JC, the St. Paul JCs ran in here, immensely profitable operation for them. Basically, for the entire month of October, they took over a large part of the of this uh, abandoned sand mine, and uh, you know they and operated it um, to, as as a source of revenue. 
Uh, some of the people in here were, I don't know how you say, say interesting, the people who ran the exhibits. And this is one of them, Michael Cam, right? And look at this. Now, when you're going through, a, a, you know, a, a, like a, 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 something like this, a house of horrors, you don't expect somebody to put a nameplate on the wall. Now, hey, I did, and here's my part. But so, it, so the JCs would like pick out different parts, different things in the mine that they that they ran in this tunnel of terror operation. And this guy, as you can see, is very proud of himself. He runs the unholy tomb in the sanitarium, and he did that for about 12 years. He told me. And so it's amazing. As soon as as soon as Halloween was over. Everyone, you know, was, everyone else just forgot about it for, for a year. Not these people. Their lives were devoted to Halloween. So right after the 1st of January, they started spiffing up their Halloween exhibit for the coming year. It's just, I mean, this is mm -hmm. quite interesting. Next slide. Uh, some, some utility labyrinths I'll talk about. Next slide. There are, if you go through the old newspaper files, there's lots of uh, little tidbit, interesting tidbits like this. Here we see in the St. Paul Dispatch, back in 1914, when it cost all of one cent. Um, tunnels under old, old hotel provide St. Paul mystery. Give me a break. I mean, you know, St. Paul, these tunnels, you know, hadn't started that many years before this. Now it all made all you know, making it sound like you know they found King Tut or something down there, and and, and this is going on in the present day, you know, when they're doing the Kellogg, you know, rebuilding in uh, Kellogg over there. Um, so what what are all these mysterious? You know, I, they they almost all of them are the, what they're doing is they just hole into these pre-existing utility tunnels that all the public works people happen to know about. So. It's no surprise to them. Next slide. And here we see it in the, I took this photo years ago in the, in the this is the pit for the construction of the Lawson building, Lawson software. Uh, and it's very typical of these, these big pits in downtown St. Paul. Um, if you can see on the top there, the bedrock, the Platteville limestone, that grayish stuff, that's the really hard cap rock on our bluffs. Then underneath, you see the uh, this greenish layer, that is the Glenwood Shale. And then this whitish stuff, this whitish yellowish, that's the St. Peter Sandstone name for, not St. Peter, Minnesota, of course, but the St. Peter River, which is now known as the Minnesota River. Because the guy who first described this, David Dale Owen, in 1847, Back then, the Minnesota River was called the St. Peter River, and he noticed it at Fort Snelling. And so that's where the Fort Snelling is the location as the mouth of the St. Peter River, down the Minnesota River, and the very first place somebody named this, gave this an, an actual place name. So there you see a tunnel. This is, this is they just, you know, the, the, they're digging them, and they just get that utility tunnel. Next slide. Now here's a, as it says, a typical cross-section underground, uh, you know, a, a street in St. Paul. I believe this is Wabashaw. And this gives you an idea of the complexity of the tunnels under downtown St. Paul. Um, it's estimated there are up to 70 miles of these artificial, these carved out passages. Uh, so it is like a multi-level kind of labyrinth. And you got all kinds of things going on in this in this image here. So we see street level, then we have solid rock, which would be our limestone. And then the one underneath that says soap rock. What the heck is soap rock? Well, that is that greenish Glenwood shale that I, I showed you in the photograph. It's kind of like, like has a soapy texture to it. And then right under that, we have the sand rock, and that's where the bulk of the tunnels are. But look at the various things we have here. The water service tunnels at the top, that's like the one right under street level. And I believe Angelo talked about that. They have the water meters in there. And for the downtown buildings, you can just walk right through there. Um, a level of house service connection, some other things here. St. Paul City Railway Company. Well, I don't think a locomotive would fit through that little passage. 
Well, it, it didn't. What it was is they just ran the cables for electric, you know, for, you know, for cable cars and, and electrified cars and that sort of thing through there. So they didn't actually have a, a train running through there. Um, sanitary sewers, all different kinds of things uh, in here. This is why during the Republican National Convention in 2008, it was such a headache to protect downtown St. Paul. It's because of this, this kind of system here. Next slide. And here's how it was carved out. This, this is carved out by manual labor. So if there's 70 miles of tunnels under downtown St. Paul itself, and another 30 miles under the Fort Road neighborhood, as I've calculated, that's 100 miles. These people dug at 10 feet a day. So you can imagine the human labor involved in carving this immense system uh, of, of tunnels on, under our uh, fair city. Uh, but this is this looks like comparatively you know comfortable kind of tunneling. You're just sitting there, kind of chipping at the wall. When you actually walk through those tunnels, so you see places that you just wonder how they what they were doing or thinking about because some are real low. So who did that? Like Tom Thumb, he was a dick. <laughs> did they employ child labor? Maybe that's ar maybe that's archaeological evidence for child labor or something. Could be. I mean, hey, a little kid that you can only just pick a foot a day, he has something he's going on it. You know, but you get these really low passages you gotta go through like this. Who dug those up? It's very uncomfortable to dig something like that. You know, for long distances. So I don't know. But anyway, they were shorter back then. Next slide. 